Greetings, everybody. Um, we wanted to give you a little bit of a update on the spinal mobilization uh, changes that we're going to be seeing um, over the next uh, couple months uh, in Vermont. There is an online training as well that the Bureau of EMS has, but we felt to, we want to give you a little bit of a short uh, background of uh, where this kind of all has all come from. If you guys have any questions with any of this stuff, feel free to call me, call or email me. I'm more than happy to uh, fill you in or discuss it further. So. The bottom line is backboarding as we know it is uh, largely going away uh, from EMS practice. This is a huge uh, change for, um, I think all of us, this has sort of been dogma for um, basically since EMS uh, began. Uh, where did this all come from? Um, well, we, we basically want evidence-based medicine and what's really nice is over the last uh, several years in EMS, we're seeing more and more of what we do or more of the changes that we have in EMS are evidence-based where before it was based on dogma. So. 1966, uh, this is where it all began. There was a report of uh, 29 patients um, in their data set with the original study by uh, Geisler um, et al. Um, and they talked about patients who had delayed paralysis uh, from what they believed was faulty handling uh, at the time. Uh, they only really discussed two patients um, in their retrospective review. Patient number one was a motor vehicle crash in 1949. Uh, he was described as initially walking around. Um, six hours later, he presented at the hospital and unable to walk. And then uh, six months um, um, after rehab, he had the ability to walk again. Uh, the second patient they uh, discussed was from 1955. It was a, a patient who had a depressed skull fracture, uh, was observed to be moving around at that point. And then 40 hours, 48 hours later, um, after the injury, he developed uh, paraplegia at the level of T10. He underwent a, de a decompressive laminectomy and then um, developed paraplegia at the T4 level. And that is pretty much um, where this uh, evidence came, uh, came from and where backboarding sort of began. Um, what they said in the study, you can see here that this man would have surely been protected from paraplegia um, had uh, the spinal instability been recognized and precautions taken. So um, basically this is sort of what I, I think of. We get this one study and everybody um, believes uh, this is a dogma, but really the evidence um, wasn't complete yet. So more evidence, there were three other studies that looked at um, spinal trauma. This was uh, 1965, 66, and 68. Uh, what's interesting, all these studies looked at how to immobilize a patient, not, um, uh, they weren't outcome-based. It was just the uh, procedure of how do we spinal mobilize them and what that technique would look like. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Orange Book, 1971. This is sort of where EMS began, emergency can of transport, care and transportation of the sick and injured. Um, in this, uh, in the Orange Book, they uh, they quoted carefully splint the injured spine to avoid um, avoiding abnormal or excessive motion. Be sure that the injured person is properly splinted and transported on a long backboard or a special um, stretcher without bending or twisting the spine in any direction. And uh, there you have it, backboarding began in EMS. In the 1970s and 1980s, uh, EMS providers were suspected of underappreciating spinal injuries, and this is where we started mobilizing patients um, based on mechanism of injury. Um, it was sort of interesting. This is uh, I remember practicing even in the 90s, even if patients were uh, asymptomatic, uh, they were in a car accident, they got a board and a collar and a cat or a short board. So there was a Cochrane review done in 2009, and they looked at um, about a little over 4,400 relevant articles. Um, there were no randomized trials. Um, they found 18 studies using healthy volunteers, and they, what, they, what we know is that more straps does equal less motion, uh, but also more straps equals more complications. And they really had no ability to state positive or negative effects of spinal, on spinal cord injury um, with using a rigid spine board. Um, this is sort of their big statement. Uh, the, the current practice of mobilizing trauma patients before hospitalization to prevent more damage may not always be necessary as the likelihood of further damage is small, can cause tissue pressure and discomfort, difficulty in swallowing or serious breathing problems, and the possibility that immobilization may increase mortality and morbidity cannot be excluded. And I think this Cochrane review in 2009 really um, started to change how um, EMS looked at uh, spinal mobilization and um, looked to change the practice. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, mechanisms of injury. You know, for decades, we put patients on um, rigid spine boards based on the mechanism of injury. And I think this uh, cartoon really kind of uh, shows you what we, we did. They were, they were in a car accident, so let's immobilize them. So we're not going to do any harm, might as well spinal immobilize them. We then developed the advanced spinal assessment. This has actually been a new tool um, for Vermont, I believe, at the paramedic level they could do it before, but this is a new new tool for most EMS providers in, in uh, Vermont um, a couple years ago. This was a huge advance because 
although uh, mechanism of injury um, did still rule, um, if there was a mechanism of injury, they have to be backboarded unless you can use the advanced spinal assessment to sort of rule them out and um, clear their, their C-spine. Um, I still think even with the advanced spinal assessment, there's still a lot of patients who are over-mobilized and um, the, the advanced spinal assessment is um, often not done um, appropriately. Uh, so patients end up being on a backboard when they didn't need to. There was a lot of over-triaging that still occurred with this. Um, we thought this was probably okay. It was conservative treatment and it's that kind of dogma piece I talked about. Uh, better safe than sorry, so let's immobilize them just in case. So this is a good example of massive over triage. Um, there were, this study looked at over a million patients with suspected spine injuries, and out of those patients, they found 0.5 to 1% 1 had clinically significant fractures. So why do we do it? What's the theory? What's the reason um, we decide to backboard patients? If a patient has fractured their spine, we thought that putting them on a backboard prevents that fractured bony fragment from shifting or causing further harm during extrication of transport. Um, this is the bony fragment theory, and the whole theory is if you have an unstable fracture, um, that um, these bony fragments can shift and slice through a portion of the remaining spinal cord. Uh, so we have doubts that this theory is actually uh, actually correct. Um, it it's, doesn't really make uh, much uh, much sense overall. And the reason is, if you have a high kinetic injury from a motor vehicle accident, um, a motor vehicle accidents that cause uh, spinal column or cord injuries involve uh, huge amounts of uh, kinetic energy. Um, a lot of times the EMS management piece of this is low kinetic energy. So careful managing of these patients by EMS providers is really unlikely to cause additional harm. So basically that the damage to a spinal cord is generally gonna be done um, at, the, at the site of injury, not from the, um, the uh, gentle handling by EMS. Secondary injury is in fact a major, uh, a major um, component of spinal injury, but it's not really from the, the injury itself, uh, from the bony fragment slicing the spinal cord. Secondary injuries in um, sp spinal injury patients usually comes from hypoxia, vascular injury, hemorrhage around the spinal cord, and often um, edema uh, as well around the cord. Um, it really doesn't occur to do these movement of unstable bony fragments. There's also uh, self the self extrication has been looked at. There's evidence that suggests that patients who self extricate from vehicles undergo less spinal manip manipulation than patients who are backboarded prior to extrication. So um, they've actually looked at um, if you use a cat or a shortboard or move somebody, extricate them onto a rigid spine board, there's more movement of the spine than having the patient extricate themselves from the motor vehicle. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, biomechanics. So the spine is not flat but a rigid spine board is. So immobilizing a patient on a rigid spine board um, kind of reverses the normal curvature of the spine and, and may cause harm. Uh, most patients' spinal injuries are mechanically um, stable. So significant forces really need to be applied at the site of injury to cause further damage and unstable spinal injuries generally cause more irreversible uh, damage at the time of injury than um, from uh, movement from EMS. So at first do no harm. What kind of harm could we be doing from rigid spine boards? So this is a picture here that um, I had taken a few years ago on a patient who was on a backboard for 30 minutes. You can see the pressure um, marks are already setting in. The elderly patient, not a lot of uh, that adipose tissue. Um, we know that backboards cause pain and pressure sores, particularly in older patients. Um, we've actually, it, it, these studies have shown that pain persists in the previously pain-free state for 24 hours after a subject, a healthy subject is placed on a backboard. And that was one hour on a backboard, which I think isn't unrealistic to be on a backboard for an hour. Um, one, we have a real system, transport times uh, can be long. And also our ED uh, colleagues sometimes aren't the best at taking patients off backboards um, immediately. Um, they really should be taking them off right away, but we know that sometimes doesn't happen and patients will kind of linger on a board, uh, will cause problems down the road. Respiratory problems, especially in obese patients. We've all seen the COPD patient, the obese patient, you try to lay them flat on a board and they become short of breath. Um, it also causes a significant aspiration risk in some patients. <clears throat> patients with brain injuries, being flat on a board causes increased intracranial pressure. It may actually worsen um, the traumatic brain injury. And more importantly, it's uncomfortable for patients and some patients have overwhelming anxiety when being placed on a board. Also delays in care. If you're trying to extricate a patient with a rigid spine board uh, or a CAD or a short board, you can have, the studies have shown you have 20, 30 minutes are required to cut up a car and extricate a patient onto a backboard when they may be able to self-extricate um, with less uh, movement anyway.
And I think a lot of this harm can be carried over to the ED. Uh, this has been looked at and patients who arrive fully mobilized are much more likely to receive unnecessary radiological tests, CAT scans and x-rays. Um, and then there's also the um, radiation exposure cost and length of stay in the ER as well. So uh, a couple years ago, the National Association of uh, EMS Physicians and the American College of Surgeons a Committee on Trauma came out with a um, position statement. And this is really where this dogma started to change. And uh, this statement uh, stated that the benefit of long boards is, is really unproven and that we know that long back boards can induce pain, patient agitation, respiratory compromise. Uh, it could decrease tissue perfusion at pressure points and lead to the development of pressure ulcers. So uh, a good quote from Einstein is that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. So this is sort of a new way that we're uh, now developing. And a lot of states have, uh, and EMS systems are, um, are following suit as well. Um, I believe the first state systems were New Hampshire and I believe Kansas were the first ones to change this a couple years ago. And just slowly um, EMS systems throughout the country are kind of changing their protocols to reflect uh, this position statement. Uh, Vermont, this is their new uh, spinal protocol. It's called spinal motion restriction instead of spinal mobilization because we're really not immobilizing the spine, we're restricting movement. Uh, the new spinal protocol uh, is really a dramatic change in practice and essentially removes, removes the backboard as a mobilization device. You guys will still be using backboards at times. Um, you might um, have to extricate a patient who can't ambulate on a board. Um, you might have, if you're doing CPR for whatever reason, if you have a patient maybe who has multiple lower extremity fractures, an unstable trauma patient, they may end up being on a backboard, but it's really not being used for spinal mobilization. It's more an, as an extrication and transport device. Um, when uh, this protocol is, you still, this lecture is not the approval to use a new protocol. You still need to do the required education online from the uh, Vermont uh, EMS. So what stays the same? Uh, the concern for spinal injury absolutely stays the same. Careful and gentle spine management is incredibly important. Uh, manual stabilization um, is still um, in the protocol when you're assessing a patient, and you still wanna assess all patients who have potential injury. Cervical collars remain, um, although they're also largely unproven. That, that's gonna be a, um, uh, for another talk um, at some point, I'm sure. And we wanna minimize spinal mo motion. What's different is we really want this to be a rule in replaces rule out. So um, this conservative approach of let's just immobilize them because of the mechanism, we really want EMS providers to think, assess the patients and um, uh, decide if they uh, need spinal mobilization or spinal motion restriction. There's really almost no backboards in the new protocol. Um, it's, uh, there's no extended extrications anymore unless the patient's entrapped. And use common sense. Um, we want you to use your brains, assess patients, think of the best way to sort of um, get a patient to move gently. Um, standing takedowns are gone. They were kind of fun to do and amusing to do, but they're no longer any protocols. And the CAD and the shortboard are essentially eliminated um, for um, use for spinal motion restriction or spinal mobilization. So this is the advanced uh, spinal assessment. Um, and this is really what providers should be doing on patients that they suspect may have a spinal injury. Uh, you have to assess the mechanism of injury. And if you have a, a child or somebody who's young enough to be unable to participate um, in the exam, and a lot of this comes to the common sense, are you know maybe you have a five-year-old that can absolutely focus on the exam uh, that you're doing. If that that's okay to um, quote unquote clear that patient, or if it's a five-year-old who's upset and can't participate, or they're too young to really understand what's going on, then it's better to take the more conservative approach and. Uh, use spinal motion restriction. Um, if the patient is anxious or uncooperative or difficulty understanding, if they have altered mental status or evidence of intoxication, altered mental status makes a lot of sense to us. Evidence of intoxication is a little tough. Um, I would say if they're slurring their speech, uh, unsteady gait, not cooperative, uh, versus a patient who smells like a little alcohol and has had a couple of beers, uh, who can fully cooperate um, and um, cooperate with your assessment and answer questions appropriately, they can probably be cleared. It's really the evidence of intoxication that they're grossly intoxicated. Distracting injuries, this is another one that um, is often difficult. Um, if they have a broken finger and they're cooperative or a broken wrist and they're totally cooperative and you can get a good exam on their spine, I think that's appropriate. Uh, if the patient has an open fracture, they're screaming in pain, that's a distracting injury. Abnormal neurological function, so if they have numbness in their extremities, tingling in their fingers, uh, weakness, anything like that, uh, that indicates a spinal injury. Uh, if they have spinal uh, pain with uh, palpation, especially midline, um, if that's uh, that's would rule them in for spinal motion restriction. Um, and if you have the patient complains of midline pain when they flex, extend, or rotate their head, uh, those patients will need spinal motion restriction. So this is what the protocol looks like. Um, <clears throat> uh, read it, know it, you know, take a look at it. With the I think the rollout um, will do a good job of explaining this. 
Um, basically, if a patient requires spinal motion restriction, you're gonna apply a cervical collar. Patients can self-extricate like we talked about. Um, if they're ambulatory, what you do is you have them move slowly and lie them flat um, on a stretcher. There's no more standing takedowns. Um, you could position the backboard, um, uh, sorry, position the uh, patient on the stretcher. Um, if they were on a backboard to begin with, say um, you're receiving care from somebody who on a backboard and they don't need um, to be on a backboard, say they're not unstable, they're not critically ill, they don't have multiple low extremity fractures, um, you can remove, the, it's expected that you would remove them off of that board. Um, I think communication is going to be key. Our lifeguards, ski patrol, um, uh, our athletic trainers all have different protocols and maybe still using the rigid spine board. So communication is really going to be um, key. And you, you don't want to show up at a, at a football field with a stadium full of 100 people and have a patient on a, a rigid spine board, with, spine board with athletic trainers there and take them off the board in front of, um, in front of the um, spectators. That's going to look a little strange. So you may decide in that case if you communicate with them to take them to the ambulance and then remo remove them off the board. But that pre-planning and communication is uh, really going to be um, in, important. And remember the treatment pi priorities. Um, patients who are unstable, you don't really want to take the time to move them off of the spine board because, um, you know, time and trauma patients, you want to move them kind of fast, um, quickly through the system. Uh, patients with a serious traumatic brain injury, if they're altered and have a brain injury, uh, the reason the spine board is still sort of in there is that you would actually be able to elevate the head of their bed a little bit um, and have them still in inline uh, mobilization. So they'll be uh, flat and not flexed, um, but you can still elevate the head of that bed to kind of elevate their head a little bit for intracranial pressure. The big thing is if the patient is lying flat, um, one of the things we found in New Hampshire is that people would often transport a patient sitting up in a collar. Um, if you need to do it, that's okay, but routinely they should be laying flat. Um, if they're, um, you know, if the patient complains of feeling shortness of breath or they're vomiting or anxious or anything like that, it is okay to, to sit them up a little bit, but ideally you want to be laying patients flat and not, um, not sitting them up. And uh, for pediatric patients, if they're in a child seat, you can keep them in that seat. Um, it, it, the old protocols were a little silly to me, how you had to take a pediatric patient, lay them on a board, put a collar and strap them down. And inevitably you're gonna get more movement because the kid is gonna be freaked out. So if they're in a child seat, padding, if they can tolerate a cervical collar, you can use a towel roll. You just wanna kind of secure them in their seat and not really um, uh, move them um, if you don't have to. Obviously, if a kid is sick and they need airway management or other problems, then yeah, absolutely move them out of the car seat and uh, treat them as you would. Uh, some kind of red flags in the protocol. Um, Interfacility transfers, we've gotten better at this, but we still may have facilities that are sending um, patients out um, with full spinal precautions on a backboard. Even if these patients are paralyzed, even if they have a known spinal fracture, there's no evidence, um, and this is pretty clear in the position statement, that uh, rigid spine boards or, or full spinal mobilization is necessary. They can be flat um, on a stretcher. Uh, so it's a little sticky sometimes if the setting provider requests a backboard. Um, what I would do is talk to them directly. Hey, this is not a protocol. We're really going to do this anymore. Um, if they say, nope, absolutely, we need you to take a patient on the rigid spine board, then um, my response would be that, you know, follow, follow the orders, uh, fill out an occurrence support, and we'll follow up retrospectively. But in general, these patients just should not be um, transported on the backboard. Penning training trauma patients, stabbing, shot, um, even with paralysis, don't need to be on a backboard. And um, always, always, always uh, don't trust older patients, 65 years and older. Um, these patients um, often will have spinal injuries from even ground level falls um, and, um, um, and are, it can be sometimes difficult to assess. So um, definitely be a little more aggressive about providing spinal motion restriction to college, uh, a collar for our elderly. Um, and even are very young, just because if they're under three, they're kind of hard to assess as well. And that's it. Any other questions you could think of? The audience says no. Uh, any questions at all, please feel free to email me, call me. And I think this is an exciting um, update that we're going to have uh, for Vermont. Um, it's really going to change our practice dramatically, and I think it's uh, great for patients overall. Thank you very much.